on behalf of Dr. Cheryl Hilton, uh, Dean of the School of Global Public Health at New York University, we're thrilled to have you with us for tonight's program. My name is Daniel Fogel. Uh, I'm Assistant Professor of Bioethics at NYU GPH. Uh, without further delay, it's now a, a huge privilege for me to introduce this evening's moderator, Ross Anderson. He's Deputy Editor of The Atlantic. And please join us in a warm NYU welcome for Ross Anderson. Welcome everyone. I uh, appreciate you all joining us for this evening's discussion, which we're calling The Social Dilemma, uh, Ethics of Technology and Its Impact on Public Health. Uh, tonight we'll be talking about social media's role in shaping our lives, our mental health and our democracy and the ethical implications of technology's presence in every hour of our waking lives. I wanna thank the NYU School of Global Public Health and the NYU Center for Bioethics for hosting this very important and timely event. And it is my pleasure to introduce our panelists uh, who I will ask to give just a little wave to kind of identify yourselves after I say your name. Uh, first, we have Jeff Orlowski, the director of The Social Dilemma, Stacy Piccolo, uh, co-producer of The Social Dilemma, Larissa Rhodes, producer of The Social Dilemma, Meredith Broussard, associate professor at NYU uh, and author of Artificial Unintelligence, and S. Matthew Lau, director of our host, uh, the Center for Bioethics at NYU. So I am going to ask our panelists, I'm gonna try not to be too greedy here, um, but I, it's rarely uh, that you get to talk to such a talented set of filmmakers and interesting thinkers. And so, I'm going to monopolize the first section of our program tonight for maybe 45 minutes or so before inviting some audience questions in. And I wanna start with our filmmakers. Um, you three are coming off two previous documentaries, uh, Chasing Coral and Chasing Ice, uh, that actually deal with issues that at first glance might seem quite distant um, from uh, tech ethics. Uh, to my mind, your previous work is kind of about this sort of existential unwinding of the natural world. And so I wanted to ask about the genesis of this project, which is, which is obviously very different in that you're not sort of wandering around, you know, the planet's most extraordinary seascapes. Um, but it's nonetheless, I guess, a little bit similar in that it's also about a kind of existential unwinding of maybe our everyday lives. Um, yes. Economy. And so I, I was wondering if you could sort of tell us, the three of you, where did the idea for this film? Yeah, totally. Yeah, thank you, Ross. Um, uh, it's just great to be here. Um, uh, I think we we sort of joke we we spent our time going from one existential threat to another. Uh, I think our whole team misses the ocean and beautiful landscapes. Um, much of this film was filmed indoors in San Francisco, um, and just a very different uh, very different vibe. But as you were saying, for us, I think it was really just big questions, um, big questions about our society, big questions about um, what's happening to humanity and the, the biggest threats that, that we see um, and kind of these asymmetric threats um, of these different industries. So um, industrial capitalism and its impact on the planet and now surveillance capitalism and its impact on humanity and our information ecosystem. Um, and so that was one of the, the entrance points for us was uh, one of our subjects referenced it as a climate change of culture. And that was sort of just a mindset of like, wow, we are actually shifting the code that is determining humanity's path forward. Um, but Larissa, Stacy, please. Oh, I, gosh, yeah, that was such a great introduction, Jeff. I think uh, it has been just quite a, a different kind of production. We went from helicopters and boats, as Jeff said, to, you know, in mostly interviews and I think trying to figure out how do we um, take what is on, you know, the other side of your screen um, and make it real, make it visual. And I think that's what Jeff did so brilliantly in Chasing Ice. And um, I was just a production coordinator on that project. Uh, but when, when Chasing Coral came around, it really became, how do we uh, visualize something that is happening below the surface um, that is completely out of sight and out of mind? And I think similarly with this issue, um, th these algorithms and the, the surveillance capitalistic view is completely out of sight and out of mind. And hopefully um, with this film and many other films and the research that the brilliant people here on this call and their books and everything that 
you know, has been happening to try to elevate this issue as an existential threat on par with climate change um, will hopefully help add to that conversation. Stacy, anything you want to add? I would just add um, to those very accurate comments that um, the issues of this being an immense uh, feeling of responsibility to communicate with accuracy and um, a sense of completeness, although we're never feeling complete in this position in, in making a documentary um, and the urgency of doing so. So sort of trying to balance the urgency of getting this out so that people are aware of what's going on um, and the immense responsibility of doing so accurate, accurately and with care. Hmm. I want to stick with the uh, craft of the film for a minute before we sort of wade into the uh, the bigger ideas with some of our co-panelists. But um, let's talk about the dramatic uh, reenactments. Um, and I, I'm I'm curious about how you thought about how they served the ideas in the film. Uh, it was definitely an inspired bit of casting to get Pete Campbell on sort of the evils yes. of advertising. Um, <laughs> but like, how did you decide which ideas were fine for your talking heads to communicate and which required this kind of larger dramatization? Mm -hmm. Larissa or Stacy, I can talk about this all day, you every go, day. I don't know if either yeah. of you want to chime in. You go. Um, uh, it's a great question, Ross. I think it's, um, uh, when you're making a nonfiction movie, um, you don't get to put your own ideas in usually. Um, you are stuck and limited to the words that you record and capture from others. And um, there are filmmakers that do different styles. So like Errol Morris will record his own voice and it's it's literally his thinking the whole time. But for, for the style that we've approached where um, there's no narration, it's coming all from your subjects. So for us, a lot of the process was um, who we were meeting at the early days of our exploration and our journey, um, which was really driven by former insiders themselves. That was the genesis, was former Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and, and what insights were they offering? Um, we then started to do a bit more exploration um, from other academics and we got Shoshana Zuboff and Rashida Richardson and some others in the film kind of in the middle stage. But um, it was that whole process at the beginning where we were trying to figure out what are we trying to comment on? And when we were meeting all of these people, there were so many different ideas where we were just trying to wrap our head around like, what is the problem? Like that, that is why we structured the opening scene in the way that we did, where we literally are asking people, what's the problem? Because are we talking about uh, one comparison, when we were doing Chasing Coral, we were getting exposed to ocean issues. People were like, oh, ocean acidification is a problem. No, it's plastic and pollution. No, it's temperature rise. No, it's sea level rise. No, it's like and everybody has a different frame. And it was hard for us as outsiders to come to like, so what's the frame of the movie? So we, we came to a conclusion around the business model um, and the, the uh, mismatched incentives between the micro-targeting surveillance driven business model and the general public and, and the arguments within that. And um, the narrative parts to your question were a way for us to bring that to life. As Larissa was saying, like what's hiding on the other side of your screen, um, there is this inside out, if you've seen that Pixar movie, the, an analogy to like anthropomorphizing the algorithms. And I think this came from a place where um, when we were learning about the project and talking about it with people, it's like, how do you get somebody to care about the notification? How do you get somebody to care about like, what is Facebook doing or Twitter doing and why? Um, and, and we were able to, I think we came up with this concept of picturing somebody at this control board puppeteering your life. And we couldn't really shake that idea. And that was something that we just kept resonating with. Um, and then that kind of uh, fully formed out into this concept that Larissa and Stacy and the rest of our team had to figure out how we execute. Um, that, was, that was the real challenge. I can I can add briefly yeah, yeah. if there's anything else you want to include, but uh, I think uh, it was it was certainly a challenge. I have to say thank you to our entire team that helped us uh, accomplish that goal. It was a ridiculous timeline, as Stacey was saying. We were trying to not keep up with the news, but try to look at what is the overall thing that's happening because every day there would be a new story that came out around these issues. Mm -hmm. Um, but it, it was really kind of a challenge to interweave the documentary world into the narrative world. And um, the editor and the writer on the team were just an incredible resource to figure out 
how do we make these two worlds collide while we're still filming the doc the documentary is still unfolding you never know where the documentary is going to end and yet we have very specific scripted um, portions that we need to we have a limited budget and a schedule to be able to accomplish so I think trying to figure out the the balance um, to make these kind of analogies come to life to a our own kind of discovery of this issue, I think is very similar to the journey that the audience takes. I would just add that um, there was a, while, while we had the scripted sections, there was a very exciting process going on in our editing because once we had the narrative footage, just really feeling how it worked with the documentary uh, interview subjects. So that was a very exciting process, but also just the fact that there has been a lot of work going on in this in this um, area for many, many years. Many activists and scholars and many people in the community have been writing and documenting some of these very concerning issues for many years. And yet we're still at this juncture um, with these massive problems that are getting worse and worse. So just really feeling a responsibility to um, find a different way in to reach people um, a different way than um, has been documented uh, up to date. Um, speaking of our academic experts that have been working on this for a long time, uh, I want to bring Matthew and Meredith into this conversation. And I want to start with you, Matthew, um, since you are our host uh, and that our, our host really is the sort of uh, the global public health uh, school there at NYU. And uh, this film really explores a whole gradient of issues related to digital technology from the personal when it comes to kind of the mental health effects of social media, uh, including addiction, um, to surveillance capitalism, and ultimately really broad scale political manipulation. And I wanted to ask you, which of those should we think of as being most properly a public health issue? Uh, that's a great question. So first of all, I just want to say that I'm a real big fan of the documentary. I thought that um, I really like the, uh, bringing sort of the insider perspective, sort of the interviews with the insiders. I thought that was really effective. And uh, how these insiders who were there, who created these algorithms and now regret doing so. And I also like the dramatization of how the algorithms are, you know, only care about user engagement and not the users themselves. So, uh, mm -hmm. so well done, uh, just awesome. a big fan. Thank you. And um, yeah, and so uh, in relation to your question, Ross, uh, I think that uh, uh, addiction is a very big uh, public health problem, but then so, as, you know, as we've seen uh, from, uh, but I think po uh, political polarization is also a very big public health problem. I mean, just, you know, if you look at the COVID pandemic, we had a, a, another meeting about COVID last night and how the polarization, like some people are not even wearing masks, like it's, it's a political issue. Um, and, you know, they, and, and so, and it's causing all these uh, different problems. And part of that is exacerbated through social media, as we know. And so I think that um, it, it couldn't be more timely to be discussing you know, these types of issues in, you know, in conjunction with public health. And we're seeing it all come to fore with respect to the pandemic. Um, Meredith, I wanna ask you for your reaction to a specific scene in the film. I was uh, re-watching it last night and, and thought of you immediately. Um, we uh, have this moment where we see Mark Zuckerberg and he's sort of acknowledging in the way that he does uh, that, you know, that these problems exist. Um, but he seems convinced that the answers to these problems are ultimately technological. Um, and not only are they technological, but they're almost certain to emerge from Facebook. Um, and there's a kind of Trumpian sort of only I can fix this vibe to that. Um, but even putting that aside, I uh, just wondering, like, do you think these tech titans are kind of acting in good faith when they say, oh, actually we can fix this or are they just playing for time? Oh, that's a great question, Ross. Uh, and I love that you, uh, I love that you thought of me at that moment because I saw that moment in the film where I assume it's the one where Zuckerberg is talking about, okay, well, I think this is a problem and we're going to build AI tools to deal with it. And I just, I just cringed inside. 
I, I don't think that the tech titans are acting in good faith. Uh, one of the things that I write about in Artificial Unintelligence is an idea called techno chauvinism, the idea that technological solutions are superior. And so this is a kind of bias that says that, okay, I, using a technological solution is always the right answer. And the thing is that it's not in this case. If it were possible to build AI tools to make Facebook not a toxic nightmare, like it would have been done already because there are some really smart people working at Facebook. Uh, there are uh, some, there are some people working at Facebook who are uh, kind of striving uh, to be good, not evil. And if it were possible to do this thing, then they would have done it, but it's actually not possible. And so the tech titans who are claiming, oh yeah, we'll just, uh, we'll just fix these things that come up. Yeah, they are just playing for time. And do you buy, a lot of times, um, I know when our magazine talks to these people, uh, I, th these people sound more pejorative than I would have liked. Um, when, our, uh, <laughs> when our magazine talks to tech executives, um, we often get this kind of sort of, oh, shucks, like who could have predicted, you know, sort of, uh, you know, uh, that something as charming as the like button could be used to sort of fan the flames of a genocide in Myanmar, you know, like what, we're just over here making cool stuff and like our bad, but we'll get our hands around it. And uh, that's the other piece and, and the film really gets to this, but how, how much, how many of these problems do you think were genuinely anticipated by these people and just sort of, uh, is this recklessness or negligence in your view? Um, the thing that I thought about uh, watching the film was executive function. Mm. And these are executives without executive function. So when you, when you create technology, you have to think about who's going to use it and for what. It's not a, uh, creating technology is not uh, something that you do recklessly. It's not something that you put out into the world casually. It really hasn't been since at least, you know, the past 20 years, like we have, we have understood okay, creating technology and putting it into the world has major consequences. Uh, so one of the things you saw in the film was the, uh, the number of people who graduated from that, uh, that lab at Stanford. Uh, Jeff, you'll have to remind me what this is called. It's like the behavior- the persuasive, uh, yeah. yeah, persuasive technology lab. Yeah, the persuasive technology lab, um, where they're, you, know, you have all these tech executives who are going to this lab and being instructed and, okay, here's how you manipulate people with technology. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it, like they're literally getting lessons in how to manipulate people with technology. Uh, and it, it boggles the mind that anybody would engage in that and think, oh yeah, this is gonna have no consequences. I'm just going to manipulate billions of people uh, and make them do what I want in order to make a whole lot of money and there are gonna be zero moral consequences. Mm. Like it's just ho hopelessly and recklessly naive. Um, I'd love to add to that if I may, um, because uh, the Persuasive Tech Lab is such an interesting, fascinating case study just in and of itself. Um, apparently they did have um, classes around ethics, but it was like the last one of the semester and one singular class. And it's like, oh, by the way, make sure to keep this in mind. And, um, and I believe they have been shifting the intention of that class over time. Um, but I'm, I'm completely, uh, I'm not saying this to, to uh, counter anything that you, you offered there, Meredith. I'm just, um, it, I, I think that particular, the people that I've met that have gone through the course have all wrestled with the, the asymmetric power that comes from code uh, that comes from, oh, we know how to manipulate people. Um, I think Tristan, one of our main subjects who went through that lab, I think he was particularly on the more sensitive side of, wait a second, there's a lot, there's a huge responsibility here. And um, he was really wanting to showcase that not everybody who went through that course was, was carrying that with that same weight. I want to, uh, Jeff, let's, let's hang on that for a second, actually. Um, 
I was hoping that you guys could talk about the process of sort of recruiting some of these former tech executives to mm, be sure. film. And especially I wondered if you had concerns and if so, and how you sort of manage them or worked with them as to whether these people could be sort of using the film to kind of launder their reputation um, after they, you know, conveniently made millions of dollars uh, creating this technology. Yeah, um, really great question. Um, uh, in many ways, Tristan was the access point um, at the start. Um, and uh, he was the, uh, I had known him through Stanford. Uh, we'd known each other in passing and I saw him post a critique about Google where he worked, where, where, where he used to work on Facebook. And so that was the very introduction for me was stumbling across that. Um, and uh, having gone to Stanford, I had a lot of friends who worked in tech and I'd never ever heard from any of them. I think I, with many of them, had the rose colored lenses on what social media could offer, um, especially after the Arab Spring as well, where a lot of my friends were at those companies at that time. So Tristan was uh, the first person that I heard criticizing from within the companies and started reaching out to others who were voicing similar ideas or that Tristan had suggested we talk to and others that we were just finding through different means, uh, people were posting um, publicly about it. Uh, we went through anonymous interviews. Um, we conducted uh, a number of anonymous interviews. We conducted interviews where people some people were very reluctant to go on camera. Some of them took a lot of convincing. Um, I never got the sense that people were trying to uh, clean up their own history. Um, in fact, in some cases, uh, in the case of Tim Kendall, we did a first interview with him and we were asking questions that were genuinely trying to push, like I was trying to push his thinking during the interview. And well, wait a second, isn't it bigger than what you're saying right now? Like these problems are, are huge. And he, he thought of it as a time and addiction one, like in a smaller frame at the time. And um, he reached out to us a year later and reflected that his thought process has evolved over the course of that year. And he shared that there was a lot more, that he had a lot more critique to offer from when we did the first interview. And, and um, in that process is when we got some of his more reflective thoughts. Um, and so I think some of these, these people are from within those companies, I think they're still going on their own journey of, um, how much Kool-Aid did they drink and how much is still in their system and where are they standing? Um, and I think some of them have, have really reflected on the, the massive impact. Um, yeah, I hope that got to your question, Ross, yeah. yeah. I was gonna add to that, to, to Meredith's point, just about how we have to conceive of the potential implications or ramifications of technology as we're designing them and that you know, we had, a, I think, a scene in the film that we removed at one point where it talked about Oppenheimer and mm. responsibility of building something that can cause ripple effects across the globe in such a, a dangerous way. And I think in this case, very similarly, uh, when, when you're looking at technology, if you're not thinking about those things, you're, you know, it's easy to just say, well, it's the bad actors. But um, I think Meredith's point about the, the design and understanding the psychology um, in the film, we have the whole section on magic and that that leads into particular type of understanding of our brain and that only those people who understand the psychology of our brain are able to have, you know, it, magic works on a doctor, a neuroscientist, it works on anyone. And I think very similarly, um, there are all of these things that as an individual, I can do to try to prevent myself from looking at my phone or checking too much. But if it's designed in a way that is meant to addict me or designed in a way that psychologically, you know, pulls at my vanity, um, the implications of that are so far reaching that um, it is naive to say that we can't think about those things when we first design them. You know, I'm glad you brought up Oppenheimer because uh, Oppenheimer is actually behind uh, a lot of today's technology. So after the Manhattan Project disbanded, uh, a lot of the people who uh, worked on the Manhattan Project developing the atomic bomb uh, kind of left uh, bomb world and went to Princeton. Uh, and they hung out at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. Uh, they were faculty members at Princeton. Uh, they went back to Harvard. And if you look at uh, kind of where artificial intelligence started, uh, it started among this uh, group of individuals who were like the younger colleagues of Oppenheimer and Teller. Um, Astro Teller, uh, who runs Google X, 
uh, is the grandson of, uh, of Teller, who was the inspiration for Dr. Strangelove. So there's, a, uh, wow. there's this really fascinating continuity between the people who developed the nuclear bomb and the people who developed computers, right? Like John von Neumann was involved mm -hmm. in both efforts. Uh, Marvin Minsky, who's the father of artificial intelligence, uh, trained at Princeton, uh, knew Oppenheimer, knew a bunch of Manhattan Project people. So there's just this really long history of people not really learning from their mistakes, right? Which makes me trust today's tech titans less, less. because mm -hmm. it's a direct genealogy of, uh, of kind of poor decision-making about the health of the rest of the universe. Wow. Yeah, that's fascinating. Maybe I can chime in here. So I just recently published a, uh, a edit collection. It's called The Ethics of Artificial Intelligence. And in it, you know, there's like uh, sort of uh, Kathy O'Neill was one of the uh, contributors as well. And one of the things I try to say in the, uh, in sort of the ethics of AI is that you know, it's very important to be proactive in thinking about these ethical issues. So there are really sort of like two ways we can go about thinking about uh, sort of the, uh, these technologies. We can become Luddites. We can sort of like one option is to go back, like, you know, have dumb phones rather than smartphones, right? Uh, quit Facebook. I wrote a New York Times op-ed about whether we have a duty to uh, quit Facebook. Right. Um, so we could also quit Facebook. So that's sort of one option. And that's a live option. And there are a lot of people who do that. Uh, Jaron uh, Lanier, I'm not sure if I'm saying his name right. You know, that, that was Jaren. what he advocated. You know, mm -hmm. Jaron, that, that's what he advocated. But there's another. Uh, and <clears throat> so but a lot of people don't want to go that route. So there's sort of another option, which is uh, I think we need to have uh, like so in, 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 the, in the ethics of AI, I advocated some sort of human rights perspective, okay? And that's mm -hmm. the idea that, yeah. you know, we're all in this together, uh, people have rights, and we need to make sure that tech companies uphold those human rights, right? And what does that mean? That means, you know, making sure that when they use the data, they use it in a responsible way, and, you know, they don't, they don't exploit the users, right? They don't violate the rights of the users. And it also means doing certain things like making sure that, um, uh, you know, I think Facebook needs to do a lot more uh, you know, like regulating of their contents, right? Mm -hmm. Making sure that uh, things are truthful. Like we're, they're not, you know, we're not together uh, spreading fake news. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think uh, Obama recently said something like, if we do not have the capacity to distinguish uh, what's true from what's false, then by definition, the marketplace of ideas doesn't work, right? And by definition, our democracy doesn't work. We're entering a, some, uh, some sort of epistemological crisis. And so that we have like everybody, that's like a moral obligation of everybody to do that. And I also think that, uh, but the, because from the human rights perspective, it's not just that the corporations have this obligation, but individuals also have the obligation. So I think we, each of us has a duty not to spread fake, uh, fake news, yes. right? Not mm -hmm. to engage with people and sort of just put out fake stuff out there. And so that's a civic duty that we all have. So. Mm. Uh, yeah, Matthew, I want to stick with you for a second as our ethicist and along some of those same lines as we've been talking about, I, I wonder if there's just an ethics of scale question here. Um, one of the real powerful moments in the film for me was uh, when one of our redeemed tech workers, and I forget who, uh, uh, says that it's, it's sort of like odd to have this tiny number of, you know, people in Silicon Valley, um, who, by the way, are all kind of extremely cultural, culturally similar, have sort of passed mm -hmm. through the same sort of weird mm -hmm. meritocratic funnels in their lives. Um, having such a disproportionate power to shape culture on a global scale uh, across billions of people and in some of these really unsavory ways as you know with Erdogan and Facebook and or Putin and you know sort of pick your example but even if you didn't have those like substantive examples of really bad outcomes is that kind of influence just ethically suspect in and of itself 
Um, yes, I mean, you know, if you look at uh, like the Koch brothers, for example, just all these, um, you know, billionaires, they're influencing, you know, I mentioned they're influencing political elections, right? And um, they're just having this outsized influence. Even Bill Gates, I mean, I'm a big fan of Bill Gates, but you might think that just nobody should have that much concentrated power to be able to influence the direction of research and where things go. That, you know, when you have just a fraction, a tiny, you know, fraction of the people around the world who, who can have this outsized influence on everybody else, right? That, that, that sort of creates an imbalance and it's bad for our society in general. Meredith, the, the problems that we hear about in this film sort of, uh, and this was another thing that sort of took me back to um, uh, uh, the Coral and the Ice films, but uh, they sort of strike me as being like climate change and that, you know, individual choices sort of noble as they may be, uh, like deleting the apps, you know, or, or kind of putting your phone in a lockbox and paying attention to your kids. Um, really can only do so much um, and that this is sort of uh, probably going to require systemic remedies, whether that's, you know, antitrust or really aggressive regulation of tech companies. And I just wondered what, you know, as someone who knows the landscape a lot better than certainly I do, um, where do you think individuals and activists are kind of getting the biggest bang for their buck in fighting this stuff at the systemic level? Uh, so I think you're right. This is a systemic problem. Uh, and as much as we as individuals think that we're fighting the power, we're not fighting the power. So we need individual action plus uh, regulation on a national, on a state, and on a global level. Uh, so one place I think we should start is just by making sure that every, uh, every tech company and every mm -hmm. application made by every tech company uh, is compliant with the law. So that means that you know, Facebook needs to uh, you know, weed out rare animal trafficking and Reddit needs to you know, not let people uh, use it to source heroin. And you know, we just need to enforce the law in digital spaces. Um, I think antitrust is a good place to start. I think that uh, more regulation overall is a good place to start. Um, I'm ready, like I'm here, I'm ready to write it. <laughs> I'm volunteering uh, and we'll just have a, uh, have a showing of the social dilemma and coded bias before we start writing it in Washington. Yes. Um, I was talking to my brother this afternoon uh, about you know, this panel and about the social dilemma and I, uh, I was talking about the uh, the part where Pete Campbell is uh, is kind of puppeteering and giving uh, giving notifications uh, to the the young man in the in the narrative section, and I was telling my brother that you know I'm really proud of myself because I have all my notifications turned off and I don't have any of my social media uh, platforms like sending me emails. And it's like, my phone is as quiet as, as, as it is possible for a phone to be, <laughs> right? And, and my brother was like, you know, they're still selling your information. I was like, oh yeah, like, I know. Like, <laughs> I'm still being sold. Like I am still a commodity. Yeah. Uh, I'm still being tracked. Like there's still a shadow profile of me mm -hmm. on Facebook, even though I'm using an ad blocker and I deleted all of the uh, advertising categories. Like Facebook still has a secondary profile of me that I can't see and I don't have access to. So you do have this like this seductive idea that if you just use the tools right, then it's all going to be fine. But mm -hmm. it's not. Like. <laughs> Right. It still doesn't work. Like you can yeah. make the tools quieter. And I think there are a lot of good ideas in the film for how to make the tools quieter. Like once you, once you understand how the tools work, but it's still pretty sinister right. and your individual effort is not going to really move the needle. I, I'd love to add to that. Totally with you on that. <laughs> um, and just uh, Ross with your climate change analogy, uh, I would extend it even further. Um, and this is one of the things that I think we've uh, been thinking about from, from our background, but in both cases, 
they're people who discovered some resource. They, they built this thing they thought was going to be super beneficial for humanity. Look, hey, look, we can fly, we can travel. And then years later, they were like, oh, wait a second. Like, maybe we didn't fully factor in all those consequences. And oh, shit, things are worse than we expected. But oh, well, we can't do anything about it now because, uh, you know, the we opened Pandora's box. We're stuck with the system. Um, and, and almost to the point where even today during the Senate hearings, um, Facebook and Twitter both were positive around the desire for reform to Section 230. I, I think in some ways, I actually do think genuinely they want it because they don't they want to stop being mm -hmm. attacked for breaking, for causing so much problems. And it's like, just give us some guardrails and we'll, we, we'll adhere to that because um, they don't know how to solve it internally without it in some cases. Um, but, but I think in, in both cases, uh, as, as Meredith was saying, these are systemic problems. These have grown to a scale that are beyond any individual. They exist in our entire society now. In some cases, they're just um, representations of capitalism in and of themselves, where I sort of look at capitalism as its own like decentralized AI that it has worked its way into billions of people now. And, um, and so we have these systems in place that have their financial incentives at the core that are um, just operating on autopilot because they, that's how they know how to make money. And they, it, it's really, really difficult to flip those entrenched systems. Um, but that's where, as Meredith Mer was saying, like we need the regulation, we need policy at all these different levels. Um, Meredith, I'd love to offline on what would your wish list be of yes. policy that you want to put on the table? Um, I have a very think, long yeah. list. I'm Great. totally happy to meet you. Super <laughs> eager, super <laughs> ego. I'm looking for that. that. Yes. Um, I want to return to the film for a little bit. Uh, for me, and uh, I was uh, saying this a bit in our, our digital green room, uh, very sad phrase that, uh, uh, <laughs> that for me, one of the most compelling visual elements of the film was where you had this kind of this digital avatar um, that lives in this kind of small chamber and this kind of being puppeted around by these various algorithmic technologies, uh, mostly by, <laughs> by the way, shout out to Vincent Cardheiser, who's actually a great actor, yeah. and should not be called yes. Steve Campbell. And I take <laughs> that, um, but, uh, uh, and then it, it's sort of the, I, I kind of enjoyed that throughout the film, like, oh, wow, I, I, like it, it allows the viewer to sort of imagine themselves being so puppeted as we are all day. It's also, by the way, the, the dissonance of checking your phone during this film is really brutal. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, uh, but then uh, at the end is where it really struck me. And, and Larissa, you have this as your background right now, when you guys kind of zoom out to this sort of honeycomb structure of similar cells where all of these the, the avatars of all of humanity are in there sort of being batted around by our digital overlords. Uh, I found that to be really powerful and, and sort of, especially in so far as it kind of echoed some sort of pop cultural science fiction tropes with the matrix or, or mm -hmm. you know, brains and bats and, and whatever it may be. And so I just was wondering if you could sort of talk a little bit about how you conceived that. Yeah. Larissa or Stacey, I, I, you want to take, yeah. You should, you should take it and then I want to talk because I, I think this represents what Meredith was just talking about with collective will, but you, you start with just the Sure. Um, well, a lot of the, the conceiving came in conversation with our subjects first around us needing to understand how this stuff works. And so learning very legitimately that there is a model built of each and every one of us on each and every one of these platforms. And the goal is to collect as much data about us to make as accurate of a model as possible. And one of our subjects had said to us, in some ways they're competing for the best model. Who can best predict each and every one of you so that when you have those 15 minutes of free time, who's gonna get that time? Or who's gonna best be able to sell you to somebody else? So in one iteration of this conceiving, we actually wanted to scale back to see like, the matrix of models from the, the Facebook equivalent. And over in the distance, there's the other, you know, 3 billion models from the Twitter equivalent. And then all of these different platforms that are collecting all of this. Um, and so when we, when we were understanding that and learning that, um, it's, it's such a visual thing that you could do, right? We can anthropomorphize this. Um, we can uh, leverage a visual metaphor and you can see that avatar get more and more and more accurate over time. And that was just another like, wait a second, this is too, this lines up so well with how we can craft this in a fictional world um, and really bring this analogy to life. So when, when we were working with some of our subjects, um, Tristan and Aza were the ones who were kind of the, the biggest thought partners in this idea. Um, it just became very clear to us that there was an opportunity here that we needed to tap into. And I think in, in to some degree as well, it was 
the filmmakers in us that just wanted to rise to the challenge of like, this is totally out of the box and how awesome would it be if we could pull this off? And then, then the idea of doing um, Vinnie Kartheiser in triplicate and then like the production challenges of needing to do things like that. But um, I, I think for, from our perspective, it, it hopefully added to that emotional feeling of being number one, outnumbered by the tech right? Like it knows us better than we know ourselves, right? That, that mindset and it can outsmart us. Um, and it's constantly learning how to outsmart us and we're constantly feeding it ways to outsmart us. And, um, so taking that mindset and, and trying to bring that to life, um, and hopefully it leaves the average person who's who is just using these platforms on a daily basis. Hopefully it changes your experience a little bit. The hope was like somebody would pick up their phone afterwards and be like, wait a second, I, I don't know how to feel about this <laughs> notification or I don't know how to feel about um, fill in the blank. So that was some of the inspiration. I'm so excited, Jeff. I, I finally found our social dilemma pun, which is out of the box, literally. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, but, but I think uh, this, like, this visualization was what I kept imagining when I kept thinking, well, how do we solve this problem? And it is like climate change. I'm such an avid believer of I want to do in part um and i'm the person that like you, my parents can't stand anymore because every time i go over i'm trying to fix a new thing that they're doing wrong um but not really um but i think the reality is when i look at this type of a kind of layout you get a sense of if oh with this one box right here if they do the right thing and they turn off and they manage their notifications or that box over there um is a parent and decides oh i'm not going to let my kids have it until high school or that you know each box kind of shuts off um still in this matrix and I think that's why it isn't just sufficient that we do as Meredith was saying individual um, behaviors that are going to change it it is a collective scale systemic problem that requires all of us to hopefully advocate for changes to the system yeah but yeah Stacey anything you want to add I mean even if you're not on social media this is officially also your problem and speaking to the yeah. systemic nature of all of this like the the harms of this extractive technology are disproportionately experienced by people. Um, people in marginalized communities uh, are harmed more than others are. So um, as we're at this moment, very overdue for many of us of like reckoning um, and understanding the way that some of these harms operate, just seeing the way that they're amplified through these technology tools. Um, so um, this visualization really um, always hits me as the it's everybody, even if you are, are not on Facebook, you're not on Twitter, this is officially your problem too. Mm -hmm. um, you are also being affected by disinformation being amplified and spread on social media. So many examples yeah. with the election, for example. Well, let's, let's talk about politics and, and in particular political conspiracies. Um, in the film, uh, Pizzagate is sort of used as a conspiracy that's aided by various algorithmic technologies, um, whether it's like YouTube recommendation, rabbit holes, or Facebook, Facebook group suggestions. And um, I'm glad you used uh, Pizzagate, by the way. I actually, Comet Pizza is, is right up the road. Oh, awesome. The, well, <laughs> we take our kids there. Uh, Have you the checked world. out their basement, though? Yeah. Like, that's <laughs> sort of peak. I hear there's a trafficking yeah. rig operating yeah. out of the basement. Uh, I don't know that. You should. Yeah. yeah. So we were, I mean, we, it was personal to us when someone went, you know, brought an assault rifle there. Um, but I, I, you know, one of the things that struck me in watching the film is that Pizzagate, you know, a lot of us in the, if I may generalize in the sort of media creation uh, business or in academia, find ourselves on the left side of the political spectrum in one way or another. And so Pizzagate is a really comfy example. Um, of sort of um, conspiracy mongering that's you know aided by algorithms, um, but the problems you're describing in the film are transpartisan. Um, yes. They uh, they operate on the right and left, and so I wondered if you might talk about where you see this kind of algorithm aided conspiracy mongering yeah. at work on the left. Uh, well, we reference vaccines as well, um, not as heavily, um, but I think that is a great counterpoint. Um, uh, and we, so we were very actively trying to maintain political neutrality throughout the film. 
um, just to be uh, explicit um, in, in this space, like there is no reference to President Trump, for example, who is obviously a very active Twitter user. Um, but the case that we were trying to make was not about President Trump specifically. Um, it was about the whole system and, and the way that's affecting everybody. Um, and so uh, even in our fictionalization, we referenced this, you know, made up extreme center as a way to just sort of play into it and lean into that as well. But um, I see these algorithms as polarizing everything. Like they'll look for any rift and pull to either extreme because that's um, what's more beneficial for, for engagement. Um, but you're absolutely right. Uh, this is something that is affecting everybody on all political spectrums. Um, and uh, from our perspective, we were intending to keep that as open as possible for anybody on any political uh, arena, regardless of my political views or anybody on our team. Um, and that actually was a, a big point of um, contention and conversation in the edit room, where there were low hanging fruit examples that were leaning one way or the other in an extremely political way that we tried to avoid. Um, Pizzagate yeah. was was one that we just felt like was um, such a clean example in some ways that it, it felt fit what we were looking for. Yeah, Larissa. I was also, uh, yeah, I was also just going to add too that I, this film became really personal um, and it gave us a lot of empathy to to better understand why people think what they think. Um, and it's so easy, especially in our country today, to see the division and see the polarization. But uh, when we were starting to dig into some of the research, we were learning, you know, being a, a, somebody who's made climate films or been part of the climate space for over a decade, um, we were seeing some of the research that Russia was pushing both pro and anti fracking propaganda um, in, in our nation and even towards the where we were living. And so, you know, I start to think about, well, if I'm anti fracking, why am I anti fracking and not necessarily questioning my belief, but actually starting to question where did my belief come from? Uh, and, and why do I believe what I believe? And that's not to say that I don't, you know, think fracking is a bad thing, but I think the reality is it starts to open up and to think, oh, now I better understand why, you know, this person is thinking and going down this rabbit hole because they literally are seeing completely different sets of information I'm seeing. Um, and that, that's not to say we want to empathize with somebody who believes uh, in a conspiracy theory, but I think it gives you a lot of understanding for how we got to this place and hopefully a way for us maybe to come back together. Um, though I think it's going to be ever challenging as yeah. the algorithm continue to polarize people. What, one, uh, just to add to that, Larissa, um, Roger Ebert referenced films as empathy machines. And there was something so, I've always loved that mindset. And especially as a filmmaker, it's like, oh, wow, we have this like tool at our disposal. Um, and yet you then think, oh, wait, YouTube is also just a whole bunch of empathy machines and maybe not made with the same intention or craft, but is just as effective and persuasive at fill in the blank argument that anybody can post and, and anything can spread. And I think this is one of the shifts that we've seen, certainly in, in journalism, where, you know, in journalism, you have friction built into the system, in, like intentional editors, fact-checking, review. There's a thorough process to make a piece of information that you're pushing out into the world. And yet these platforms um, say, we'll take anything and we'll pour lighter fluid on all of it and we'll spread all of it to maximum impact and maximum virality. And quality doesn't matter. Uh, accuracy doesn't matter. Truth doesn't matter. Fact-checking is non-existent. Um, and that's the system that is kind of deconstructing our information ecosystem. And that, that for me, as, as was referenced earlier, and I think Matthew were alluding to that as well earlier around truth and the breakdown. And, and if we don't have a shared sense of truth, how do we solve any societal challenge? Um, I think that's where a lot of my own personal like anxiety about where our technology, the, the, the current trajectory where it's going to continue at least um, for the time being, uh, hopefully just for the time being. But that's that's where if there's a continued breakdown of any shared sense of truth, how do we function as a society? Yeah. And Facebook, you know, likes to make the argument that its algorithms are sort of similar to Amazon's arguments, sort of uh, uh, algorithms, right? That, you know, it's just it's the same algorithm as you know the stuff the algorithms that recommend books to you or movies to you like netflix but it's different um so when you look at moral and political realm there it's it's different right there uh there's sort of a normative standard there's sort of certain things that uh, unlike books right or just movie you know those are more preferences in the case of the uh, in the case in the moral realm the political realm we really need to be governed by truth right and so that's one of the things that uh, uh, when you uh, 
when someone posts something on Facebook and then another person shares it, I, I really think that Facebook needs to think a lot more about what that sharing means, right? Mm -hmm. And it needs to just curate that, uh, uh, you know, uh, that content a lot more. I mean, you know that, you know, you work at the Atlantic, Ross, and sort of no, like, you couldn't just put an article out there, right? It goes through certain editorial processes, et cetera, et cetera. And yet it's so easy for us to click that share button. And then a political, a piece of political news then gets just transmitted just like that, right? No. And I think just we need to put in a lot more thoughts into that process. Hmm. You know, I think we can also consider the climate impact of, uh, of social media. Mm -hmm. uh, so Kate Crawford has a book coming out soon about the environmental impact of AI. And so training AI models uses an extraordinary mm -hmm. amount of energy like way more than you would imagine. And the uh, environmental consequences of strip mining for the materials that, uh, that we need in order to make new computers or make new phones is just devastating to the environment. And so the more AI models we make, the more uh, energy we use and the more popular the say social media companies uh, products are, the more energy we use and the more it contributes to climate change. So in a certain sense, it's not just like climate change, right. it is involved <laughs> in climate yes, change. Yeah, literally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, just the Bitcoins, right? Bitcoin as well, yeah. 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 I wanna stick with you, Meredith, on the, um, and go back a little bit to algorithmic prediction. Um, you, uh, yeah, I mean, you've done a lot of work on, on sort of algorithms being actually bad at predicting um, or being sort of inaccurate in uh, various ways. And in the film, we encounter this claim um, based on sort of, uh, you know, a 2D graph showing that processing power is, you know, still going up and up and up and up that actually algorithmic prediction will only get better. And I was wondering, I, I, I thought of you again, actually, uh, and was wondering sort of what you make of that claim. So computing power is getting better and better. Uh, and yes, predictions do get better and better. Uh, ultimately, it is impossible to make a computer that <laughs> operates as well as a human being. Uh, there's a lot of fantasy about making, uh, making an AI that thinks like a person. Uh, but that is purely a fantasy out of science fiction. Uh, it goes all the way back to golden age science fiction. Uh, and it's, it's pretty egomaniacal. Like the idea that, uh, that you want to make a machine in the image of yourself, like is, I mean, that's what, uh, you know, that's the plot of Frankenstein, right? Of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Uh, so I sort of feel like if you want to make something in your own image, like have a baby, don't worry about making a, uh, making a computer that thinks. <laughs> uh, so we have to be reasonable about our fantasies. Um, and we also have to be uh, realistic about what are the kinds of predictions that AI can and can't make, and also where does AI fail? Uh, and so one of the things that, uh, that I wrote about a lot is the way that AI is racist. Um, so AI will, uh, for example, like facial recognition. Uh, facial recognition systems will recognize uh, pale males really effectively. They're better at recognizing men than women. They're better at recognizing people with light skin than people with dark skin. Uh, so you have to ask, like, who are the predictions tuned to uh, and who benefits from the predictions and who is harmed by the predictions? You know, it's primarily, you know, vulnerable communities, communities of color who are harmed uh, by algorithmic systems. Well, well, we're, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Liz. Well, I was just going to add that uh, Meredith also appears in another film that is out right now actually in theaters, uh, virtual theaters called Coded Bias. And if there are listeners watching, they should absolutely go see that on their website. You can find how to view it virtually. And there's also a panel, a big panel coming up, I think this weekend, uh, moderated by Thursday. Vandy. Yes. Oh, Thursday. Sorry. This weekend yes. is. 
Tuesday, yes, <laughs> Thursday, moderated by Van Jones. So um, uh, we, it, it is uh, super important and the work that Meredith did in there is also um, visible. So just wanting to shout out that film as well. Oh, thank you so much. Um, hanging for a second on algorithmic prediction, I've been dying to ask our filmmakers uh, what you made of the irony of Netflix being the distributor for yes. this film. Um, <laughs> in my mind, they sort of uh, pioneered a certain kind of uh, algorithmic prediction, like, you know, yeah. murder mysteries in European locales, yeah. with a villain who shot in the end, etc. cetera. Um, and I know that all of us working in creative fields and even academic fields kind of have to make our peace with mega corporations and billionaires to do our work. But just tell me how you wrestled with that. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think ultimately um, in large part because our critique was around the business model itself. Um, you know, you see misinformation and conspiracy theory going viral on YouTube and Facebook and Twitter, not on Netflix. So um, there is a element, an element of human curation that exists at Netflix, which I think is part of what's meaningfully different there. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, I think the algorithms are much lower stake algorithms and the, the stakes of the algorithms that you, and the information that's being shared on other platforms. Um, but if I were to step back for a second and look at what our hopes and goals are, um, in some ways, like the algorithms then go to the same types of audiences that are interested or curious about certain types of content, um, which is why a lot of the work that our team does and the impact work on our team is um, for our climate work and for our tech work, it's kind of looking at how do you break beyond the algorithms? How do you get beyond the filter bubble and the echo chamber of any subject? Uh, I think in many ways, that's how we got into this in the first place was that we were doing so much climate work and we kept meeting all of our friends watched all of the climate movies. And yet when we would go on tour to other parts of the country, um, we would meet people who didn't know anything about climate change and hadn't seen any of the films. And it was like, well, wait a second, how do we get to that audience? That's where we really need to take the conversation to. And so um, a lot of the, the work that our team is, is thinking through is how do you build communities um, and leverage different um, audience members and who are the trusted messengers and how do you get to different places so you can bring the conversation to the place where you need to have it. Um, and so I, I think uh, we're grateful for our partnership with Netflix to get the film out there and to have a global conversation about it. Um, in the first month of the film's release, 38 million people saw The Social Dilemma. Like that's great, that's huge, like a huge, huge response there for which we're incredibly grateful. Um, but we still need to have the, the, the film screening and coded bias and a thousand cuts. And, and we need to have these conversations with the audiences that wouldn't necessarily be going to watch this film in the first place. Um, Matthew, getting back to uh, a public health question. Um, I know one thing that stuck out to me while I was watching this film is that it traffics in the language of addiction. Uh, and I know there's been a lot of dispute in some of the literature around whether such language is appropriate uh, for our various dependencies on smartphones and other technology. And where do you come down on that question? How do you see it? Yeah, so there's a distinction in the literature on addiction between substance addiction and behavioral addiction. And so internet addiction or sort of addiction to social media would fall on more on the sort of behavioral type of addiction, if it's a type of addiction at all. There's some similarity. So I think the, the documentaries kind of drew out that out really nicely about the dopamine, how it sort of excites you and sort of over time, uh, your brain chemistry uh, uh, changes, right? And then you, you now need to, you know, I think, right, around the dinner table, they were fighting, they were trying to sort of grab the phone, right, and, and things like that. That was very nicely dramatized. And um, I think that can certainly happen. I think, I do, I, I think, uh, I'm actually, I just uh, finished the paper on addiction. I think behavioral addiction is a real phenomenon. Um, and, you know, you see people who say that they play video games and they end up dying like this, this, this boy in Korea, right, sort of played uh, video games for three days and then just died because he didn't, you know, drink or eat or et cetera, et cetera. Believe, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I think it's a real phenomenon. Um, and the, the question is like, how do you explain that? Um, you know, yeah, so. I guess I, and this is actually a question for everybody and then I'm gonna take some questions from the audience. Uh, I, I, in working on this film or in the course of your research, Meredith and Matthew, uh, have you come across or sort of imagined yourself 
alternative versions of these technologies that sort of preserve their utility uh, without all the harms. I mean, one of the things I loved in the film was just the intellectual honesty around that, that like you mentioned the Arab Spring earlier, Jeff, I mean, even though that that unwound a bit, um, but like just that, that obviously, obviously social media has brought a lot of wonderful things to our lives and, and helped us stay in touch with you know, family in ways that are uh, much more vivid um, than in eras past. And yeah, I just wondered if, you, if you've if seen things that, that are sort of uh, a better bespoke, uh, maybe social media 2.0 out in the world. Yeah, maybe. I, so I, I'm more of an optimist. I think that there can be. And as I was saying earlier, I think that a social media 2.0, one that sort of uh, takes right seriously, takes people's rights seriously and try to make sure that it's not just, does, it doesn't violate, like proactively not violating people's rights, you know, and also promoting their rights, right? So not allowing hate speech on the platform is a good start. Not allowing uh, Steve Bannon to say, hey, you know, let's go behead uh, Dr. Fauci, you know. Um, I think Twitter banned uh, Bannon, that was a very good step, whereas Facebook said that it hasn't quite crossed the line and that's a big problem. Right. Um, and so I think that's a, you know, I, I can, you know, you can imagine organizations where they uh, take seriously people's data and they, you know, they treat that data with, uh, you know, like with, you know, sort of people's dignity, you know, they, they take that seriously. And I think uh, we can do that. And maybe I, I do think we need regulation. So I agree with Meredith. Uh, I don't think that these, uh, or these organizations are too big and they can't be counted to self-govern. They just don't know how to do it. They're as the, I, I think the talk, that's what I really like about the documentary. You know, they're just, they're, it's profit driven, right? And sort of, um, that's their sort of, the, the business model is to get people, users to engage as much as possible. That's it. And so I think we need external uh, things to act on that organization. I do, I do think they, uh, some of them do want to do well, but they don't know how to do it. And so I think as a society, we need to help them along. Um, so I think uh, a couple of things about this. Uh, I think that we have to think about the difference between popular and good. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. this is something that I write about in my book. Social media companies uh, use popular as a proxy for good. Mm -hmm. And Kathy O'Neill talks about this in The Social Dilemma. There is no proxy for good. So there are lots of things in the world that are popular, but not good, like racism or ramen burgers. Okay. So computers are never going to be able to autonomously determine what is good, right? That's always going to be a human interpretation. It's always going to be contextual. It's always going to be situational. So I think we just need to give up on the idea that it's ever going to be possible to build AI tools that are going to determine what is good. We have to just accept mm -hmm. that that's a human, uh, human discernment. Uh, I think one of the things that people are often anxious about when they think about uh, social media 2.0 is they think, oh my God, well, if I don't have Facebook or I don't have Twitter, how am I, or if I don't have Instagram, how am I ever going to get in touch with my friends? And <laughs> I, I'm, a, I'm a little bit older than Mark Zuckerberg, and I can guarantee you that before there was Facebook, we did a very good job of keeping in touch with our friends. Uh, we had, yes. uh, you know, it was very easy to exchange baby pictures mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, mail each other pictures of what was happening in your life. Uh, it's even easier now. Uh, so there's absolutely a world beyond, uh, you know, the dominance of social media platforms uh, and we don't need to be afraid of it. Uh, is that world as profitable? Uh, no, like the social media companies are really, really good at extracting money from you, uh, at monetizing your attention. And previously that money went to, uh, you know, the advertising dollars went to media organizations and uh, we had better journalism then. We had, you know, journalism as a more stable occupation then. 
Uh, that was good for democracy. Having less journalism is bad for democracy. Uh, so there's, there's absolutely a world beyond the current configuration of, uh, of tech dominance. And we should embrace it, but we should also be realistic about it. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm with everything you said, Meredith, and at the same time, I'm going to offer a couple extra thoughts there in that um, uh, completely with you on, we, we don't have a proxy for, proxy for good, we don't have a proxy for truth, um, but I, I do envision a possible path where we have meaningful socially focused technology that doesn't need to be AI driven in the first place, that as you were saying, Ross, doesn't need to go beyond the scale of how humans actually interact, right? All the psychology around the Dunbar number, we, we can maintain 150 meaningful relationships in our lives. The ideas that Twitter and Facebook have been putting out into the world is that more is better for every, like you can't have 5,000 friends, yet Facebook wants to convince me that I can. Right, and so what does it mean to have deeper social relations with your close friends and family? Like Zoom is a great technology that's allowing us to have a meaningful conversation. All right, I use FaceTime all the time. As you were saying, Meredith, there are plenty of other ways to talk to your friends and family. Um, but one of the things that, that excites me, and I just throw this out there as a, a hypothetical or a hope, like what could a social technology look like that you wanted to spend $10 a month on? Mm. Right. That wasn't driven by a feed that wasn't driven by infinite scrolling that wasn't driven by like stay in touch with every possible human you've ever met in your entire life. But what if you and your closest group of friends had technology that supported uh, like a council tribe or a group that came together or like how can technology possibly exist where it did provide positive meaning and value in your life? I believe my, my understanding from, from people that we've spoken to is that the business model exists right now for these companies in the way that it does solely because it is the most profitable for them, that they've priced out what does a subscription model look like for us? And it turns out the value of Facebook or Twitter isn't strong enough that people wanted to pay from what I've heard from years ago, they wouldn't have wanted to pay enough to make a meaningful amount of, it wouldn't have yielded the revenue that they do. Um, Facebook makes more per user in the US than Netflix makes per user in the US. And that's not via subscription, that's by selling the customers, right? So I, I, I'm completely with you, Meredith, but I still pose the question of, what could a totally new type of socially driven, socially focused human, human relation focused technology look like if the value is there for us as the customer, not for an advertising model, but like I wanted to spend money to build deeper relationships with people in my life. And, and once again, treat that totally separately than news and information and an infinite feed of every possible true or false thing in the world. Um, I, and uh, I don't know, I just throw that out there. This is not like technology is gonna solve this problem, but I'm, I'm optimistic that there could be something that people actually find greater value from. I, the eternal optimist is over here. I don't know. I, I, no, I, I, I yeah. think, Jeff, there's more to that than, I mean, I mean I'm, I'm sure you know about various experience, experiments along these lines. I have a, uh, a friend, the novelist, um, Robin Sloan, who does uh, a little coding uh, alongside his writing. And he made a sort of Instagram clone for like him and, and his nuclear, his like sister and parents. And he's like, it's my favorite app. It's so good. I mean, it's, it's like completely lovely. You get all the features mm -hmm. um, of these uh, larger apps with, with sort of none of the downsides. So I, I do wonder if something more bespoke, something more human mm -hmm. scale, as you say, the profit yeah. motive is, and, or even just going to a subscription model versus a, an right. advertising model. I mean, we're seeing that at, uh, in the little old world of magazine journalism also where pivoting to a subscription model and instead of trying to sell ads, you know, just makes for a, a better product um, for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, as I said, I, I uh, did want to go to some audience questions and have been entire, even greedier than I thought I would be. Um, I want to start with one that I thought was really interesting uh, by Elisa Rowe, um, who says, uh, you know, she's really pointing out the tension that a lot of us worry about the privacy issues that are inherent to, um, uh, our smartphones and the many sensors that they have in them. Uh, but she points out that sort of uh, those, those features would have been essential um, to a robust track and trace um, software system uh, used for sort of fighting this pandemic. And I wonder, Matthew, perhaps um, 
there in the School of Public Health uh, being a tech ethicist. Maybe you're the person, perfect person to answer this question. Um, how do you think about that tension? Yeah, so, you know, it, this is what I was saying earlier. You know, with technologies, there's always dual use. Uh, you know, uh, I think Meredith talked about the Oppenheimer, right? Nuclear, there's, you can use it for the bad, right? Nuclear weapons, or you can use it for nu nuclear power, right? Um, and same with, uh, same with uh, sort of digital tracking devices for the contact tracing. It's very important that you can track people, uh, keep accurate track of people for, you know, in order to control the pandemic. And so uh, if that's the case, if, if technologies can be used for good or bad, then it's not just about technology, it's also about us. And it's mm -hmm. about how we use it and how we decide to use it. And that's why um, I'm not necessarily saying that we should wholesale just get rid of these technologies, right? And that's why I'm more on the optimistic side. But I do think that we need to change the way we use it. And we already have certain existing guidelines. You know, so, you know we have, I think Meredith has talked about, look, just get people to obey the law. That would yeah. go very far towards help solving the problem, right? And I think in addition to that, you know, internationally, we have human rights framework that we can bring in. Um, and I think that if we just bring that, you know, some of those normative perspectives in here, that may go some ways towards solving a, a, a lot of these problems. Uh, not all, not all the way, because you're always going to have bad actors, right? But that does, I mean, just because uh, murders occur every day, even now, doesn't mean that the law's bad. <laughs> you know, like, like law against murder is bad. Like we should still try to have the law, and most people don't go around killing other people. Um. We have an audience member, Ben Hathan, who asks a really interesting question. He says, uh, as we've watched the primary social media companies try to curb the spread of disinformation uh, through the election, and uh, he very appropriately has scare quotes around the word try, uh, the result was the emergence of, even, of an even more sinister platform, uh, Parler, or Parlay, I'm not sure even how you say that. Uh, how can we anticipate solutions that sort of like, uh, how do we get around that kind of whack-a-mole problem when it comes to social media companies? Well, here's something interesting that has happened uh, with, uh, with open source technologies and with uh, abandoned technologies. So the internet is littered with the remnants of technology experiments. Uh, and there have been plenty of other social networks besides Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, what have you, uh, that have been created, have been published as open source, and then people kind of wander off and forget them. Uh, so there's a, uh, there's a story about one open source uh, social network that was abandoned and then was picked up and uh, repurposed as a social network for terrorists, right? So the, uh, the afterlife of, uh, of technology uh, also matters and we have to think about what we build before we build it. And we have to think about the potential consequences and the potential misuses of things that we create. Yeah, just another thought to add there. Um, uh, we we look at uh, in in the film we lean into um, the business models of the social media and search companies, um, but that's not obviously there are a bunch of different frames that are available here, and uh, one of the frames from Shoshana Zuboff is around the surveillance capitalism frame, and from my perspective. Um, from everything that I've seen, that is one of the best distillations of like the big picture of what's going on, right? It's not just data being used and manipulated for attention. It's not addiction. Addiction is the most tangible, accessible thing in my mind for, for some people, um, uh, just as a singular frame. There are lots of lots of uh, avenues in and way people, ways people can connect, but, um, but the surveillance capitalism frame, in my mind, is the level where we should be having the conversation around legislation and solutions, where we need to figure out what are the laws that we can implement that would fundamentally shift the way data is being collected and manipulated against us, so that we're not solving, you know, content moderation on platform X, we're changing the way content moderation exists as a whole, at, at the whole system level. Um, and, and that's one of the things where I don't, I'm curious what that possible legislation could look like. Meredith, if you have your like notes on uh, somewhere where that can add to that. Um, and I, I have found in this process, it's been challenging um, 
I haven't seen uh, that many people that have like, this is the legislation that I want to pass. Mm-hmm. Right. There's the, um, and some of the people that I've spoken to, it's like, we need legislation, but what is, okay, what's the law look like on paper? Um, and that's what I'm personally very, very curious about because I think how do we design legislation that gets to the, the, the heart of the question that you can't just have another new system replicate with a different intent, with different values embedded in it um, that then have their own negative consequences in some ways. Um, so I don't know, that, that's the curiosity in my mind around what's the, the deepest root cause legislation that could, uh, that could surface. Yeah. Oh, I was just no, going to no, no. just, I think Meredith raised the question early on of asking the hard questions of like, who gets to make that decision? Yes. Who gets to choose with what data is input into those original algorithms for whatever the new platform is? And I think until we're addressing those issues, we are just going to be playing whack-a-mole with the next thing. Uh, do we think, and, and I'm, I'm sure this has been uh, greatly aided by this film, uh, having been seen by some 38 million people who are surely distributed across the political spectrum. Um, do we think, and, and Meredith, you've probably looked at this closer than anybody, but um, there's a sort of political, a broad political constituency for these changes. I mean, you see To my mind, like there's obviously people on the left that are outraged about this, usually from kind of an antitrust angle, but you also, I mean, Josh Hawley in the Senate and Ted Cruz for sort of often poorly motivated reasons. uh, These people are are constantly attacking um, social media companies, usually for questions of political bias, but of course are not kind of insensate to some of the issues we've been discussing. And I just wonder, do you see a, a political consensus emerging that's bipartisan that might have the sort of guts to do this? And to what degree is it diluted by the sort of enormous sums of money that are flowing into k uh, right here in DC? Well, I think you're absolutely right. There is a bipartisan consensus around the idea that we need more regulation. And uh, any progress on that front is undermined by the enormous, enormous amount of money that tech companies are spending on lobbying because uh, they're, they're, they're pro-regulation. Uh, they recognize that they're getting beaten up and they don't want to get beaten up anymore, but also they don't want the regulation that uh, is going to uh, eat into their profits or make it harder yeah. for them to operate. Right, so we're kind of at a stalemate. Uh, there is a, uh, a release up right now on Facebook's uh, PR site uh, that has uh, proposed principles for regulating to control the flood of misinformation. <laughs> uh, so I think it's just, it's fascinating. Uh, that, they wanna be regulated. <laughs> yes, yes, they're like, yeah, regulate us. Here's an idea, you should definitely regulate us. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't think that letting Facebook write the regulation is quite the right thing because <laughs> self-regulation is what got us into this mess in the first place. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I do, uh, Jeff, I wanna go back to something you said earlier about what does this regulation look like? Uh, I think we've gotten stuck with the idea that regulation has to be perfect before we roll it out. And Mm -hmm. so I would say, let's take a page from Silicon Valley and let's be iterative about it Mm -hmm. because the Mm -hmm. law is actually iterative. It's the, like, it's the or iterative process, Mm -hmm. right? Like we're not still operating according to the letter of the law in the Magna Carta, Mm -hmm. right? Like we, we have the constitution, we have amendments to the constitution. Like we put a law or a policy into place and then it changes. Right? So when it comes to tech regulation, we shouldn't let the perfect be mm. the enemy of the good. We just mm. have to start somewhere. Yeah. So there are lots of places where we could start. We could start with making sure that tech companies are uh, legally compliant. We could start by implementing GDPR in the US. We could start with antitrust. We could start with you know, legislation around content moderation. Like any of these places would be a great place to start and we could just take it from there and iterate. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, if um, Meredith, imagine that uh, um, on January 21st, uh, President Biden comes to you and says, uh, you know, you're my antitrust czar. Who's getting broken up first? 
Ooh, <laughs> good question. I uh, I really have to choose. I can't just do like the whole, all the big nine all at once. You got to pick your favorite. Oh man. Okay. Where would I start? I, uh, I would probably start with Facebook because they also own Instagram and WhatsApp. And I, uh, and I think I would get the most bang for my buck. Uh, but I might also start with Google um, because uh, Google, it has far more subsidiaries than I ever remember. Um, yeah, I think probably Facebook or yeah. Google I would start with. Um, we also have, mind you, like a, a vision of what happens after, uh, after antitrust. Like the antitrust degree with Microsoft yeah. was actually really effective. Like Microsoft has been a responsible corporate citizen since uh, their antitrust you know, mess. Uh, AT&T is a good example of, uh, of what happened uh, effectively after antitrust action. So way back when uh, the mm -hmm. Bell Telephone Company was determined to be a monopoly and they had to break up into all the different baby bells, mm -hmm. right? That gave rise to AT&T. Um, AT&T Bell Labs is actually where I uh, started my career as a computer scientist. And they invented all kinds of amazing things like lasers, okay, and transistors. And so we, we have a model for, okay, we can have lucrative corporations that exist after a big corporation is broken up. Yeah. We have a precedent. So it's not the end of the world. If we break up the tech companies, everybody can still make a lot of money and have their jobs and it'll be great. And uh, Ross, to your bipartisan question earlier, mm -hmm. um, uh, something that happened this morning um, during the Senate hearings was that uh, Lindsey Graham asked Facebook and Twitter as Zuckerberg and Dorsey if, uh, if they had seen the social dilemma, hmm. and uh, which was like a total shocker. But the, <laughs> the reason why I bring that up is because the framing that he, he introduced the question with wasn't one around content moderation. It was one around the manipulative techniques and a comparison to cigarettes and uh, a responsibility to shift our ways as we did with cigarettes. And so that was that was an interesting indicator for me in that the question wasn't coming from a, um, a partisan perspective around yeah. content moderation or mm -hmm. censorship. The question was just coming from a genuine place of corporate manipulation of the public. And uh, and that gave me uh, some potential hope around that aspect being something that both parties could really get behind. You know, I love the image of Lindsey Graham, like mm -hmm. sitting on a sofa watching the social dilemma. Uh, like that's love, really, uh, right? that's really delightful. I actually so. don't love any image of Lindsey Graham off the back, but uh, <laughs> no, um, look, I, I think actually that that note of bipartisan hope is <clears throat> maybe the perfect place for us to end here tonight. Um, and I just want to uh, thank our filmmakers um, and our panelists, uh, but um, our filmmakers, this is a, a truly extraordinary thing that you guys put out into the world. And I know is, um, is changing, has already changed a lot of times, uh, including Lindsey Graham's. Lindsey Graham's, um, yeah. And I, as I said earlier, it just brings, you know, I, for years when I was tech editor at the, at the Atlantic, you get all this stuff kind of piecemeal, um, one bit at a time. And this was the best sort of synthesis I've seen. Like mm -hmm. if you're going to sit someone down and be like, watch one thing, this is the thing. Oh, and wow. Congratulations to you guys. For well, thank you. Um, thank you and Meredith and Matthew, thank you as always um, for, uh, uh, all of your sparkling insight. Um, I thought this was a wonderful conversation. And uh, yeah, until next time. And thank you to the NYU School of Public Health um, and Center for Bioethics for hosting us. Um, this was great. Thank you so much for having thank you, us Ross. and connecting thank us. Thank you all. Thank yeah. you. This was terrific. Thank you so much for the conversation.